All right, so today I'm going to talk about obstetrics in the AW139. So my name's Ben Shepherd. I'm an emergency pre-hospital and retrieval physician. And look, I'm really, you know, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk at your education day today. Um, now, this talk's not necessarily going to be a talk about obstetric emergencies. I know that, like many retrieval services in Australasia, it's not a common platform, the rotary wing aircraft, to do maternal transfers. I know that within you know, New South Wales Ambulance, a lot of these are done by midwifery trained flight nurses on fixed wing aircraft, and that's pretty common around the country, really. I've been asked to come and talk about this particular topic just because given it's going to be such an infrequent thing, it really does give everyone the opportunity to have a, a, a real think about how you're going to manage the difficulty of both the unfamiliar obstetric patient and also the somewhat challenging environment of the AW139, at least for obstetrics. We will touch on some aspects of obstetric emergencies or at least how you might start off your initial approach to managing those en route and we'll talk a little bit about how you might get ready for some of these jobs you know just considering you know the aircraft itself and the, the stuff you want to take with you and and also you know things just making sure you all understand what this might be like for a patient as well I think is important. Now, while this is a very uncommon scenario, it is one that, you know, can come about. And I've been involved in a delivery in transit on a, uh, a 139. And I can tell you from personal experience, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a super comfortable scenario, as I'm sure you can imagine. So hopefully that, you know, everyone can take a little bit out of this. And I hope that it adds value to your training day today. Now, the first thing I'm going to... I'm going to bring up is just this concept of what are you actually going to do. I guess as a registrar, even as a consultant talking to my own registrars, I hear a lot of superficial conversations around, oh, that's fine. If this happens, I'll just do this and this. And there's not always a good understanding of what's required to do these things or which of those interventions are really going to add value to your patient care. And certainly, as I'm sure everyone's aware in this challenging and you know very rewarding job in pre-hospital retrieval medicine, these things can be more difficult. So I think it's just a really important opportunity that you really understand what you're going to do and how you do it. So we're going to come back to this question through the talk, and I want you to think very specifically about what you are actually going to do when it comes to some of the different problems we talk about and some of the different aspects of getting ready for a job. So look, the first one we're going to talk about is, you know, managing the cabin of the 139. Now, not having worked with New South Wales Ambulance, but having spoken to some crew members and, and medical staff, um, this is the configuration of the 139 en route to a patient. So you've got the two rear-facing seats, the two folded up forward-facing seats, and your stretcher deck orientated horizontally across, you know, the, the rear cabin staff. Um, the, the stretcher will then become patient head to nose of aircraft uh, on return to receiving facility but I just want you to imagine this space and have a bit of a think about how you might deal with some of the difficult maternal transfers. Now I guess the more common jobs you're probably going to get are the medically sick mother or medically sick pregnant woman in third trimester or you might get the post-delivery, postpartum hemorrhage. It's probably unlikely that you're going to get the laboring woman and there's a few issues as to why those jobs are uncommon. But I think it's an opportunity just to think about that latter scenario because it's probably the one where the management of the cabin is the most important. And a few things I think you, know, you might want to think about before you go on the job is to think about you know, where you might sit the staff. I understand on that picture we can see the flight paramedic seat and we can just see the front edge of the dock seat which is usually behind the air crewman but you may want to consider things like moving the dock back to the forward facing port side seat just to allow some uh, pelvic access in the setting of an unexpected delivery or to provide some hemorrhage control in the setting of a postpartum hemorrhage and just think about what you might want to do with the bridge um, my thoughts would be don't 
take the bridge. You know, you could have the the Zoll up in behind the cargo net, um, and that would probably be a more reasonable approach. You know, it's a very difficult scenario to think about managing a space, particularly if you've got a, a laboring woman. And I think you just want as much access to the woman as possible. And and I guess to take it a step further, you know, considering having your paramedic and doc in the cabin on a wander strap prior to departing might also be helpful. But that's, again, as usual, going to be something you're going to have a chat to your pilot and air crewman about. The next thing about obstetrics which can be challenging is thinking about some of the fluid containment. Now, we know obstetric patients can bleed significantly, you know, third trimester or at least at term, the placenta receives somewhere around 800 mils per minute. And if you're dealing with a brisk postpartum hemorrhage, you know, you're going to have a obviously a severe clinical issue, but also, you know, these aircraft um, have semi-permeable floors and that can be a problem for ongoing jobs. So you want to have a think about what your fluid containment strategy might be. Now, in your service, that might be a, a, you know, one, two, three, four pinkies, a body bag. Just have a think about these things or maybe sit down as a service and think about exactly what you're going to use for fluid containment. You know, obviously, at the completion of the job, if there's been some contamination of the cabin floor particularly, you're going to need to do some superficial cleaning and let the engineers know so you can decide, you know, when the aircraft might be back online or what needs to happen or whether you're going to do an aircraft changeover whilst the engineering can come in the next day. So again, these are things that, you know, there is some overlap with some of your sick primaries with some particularly limb bleeding that might uh, come up occasionally, but in obstetrics, the bleeding and definitely the amniotic fluid both have the ability to be quite corrosive to the aircraft and therefore a real important consideration on these jobs. Usually on services such as your own, you've got fairly standard equipment that, you know, help us deal with airway management, medication administration, dealing with primary jobs, inter-hospital transfers, blood products, ultrasound machines. These are all fairly standard on most of these rotary wing platforms. One of the things you might realize, though, is that that's not necessarily all super helpful in an obstetric transfer. Now, again, the inter-hospital transfers of a postpartum uh, PPH woman or a really medically sick third trimester patient, they're, they're going to be somewhat more helpful with the kit that you carry. But if you're faced with managing someone in labor, whether that be preterm or at term, I think it's important that you think about where some of this gear might come from. Now, really, I, I've thought about this in a lot of detail just due to my own prior experiences. And, and I think that you don't need a lot of equipment to deal with you know, this very uncommon job with an overlying very uncommon incidence of having in-flight emergencies. But it is worth having a few things. And I know that your road amb ambulances do have a delivery pack, so that would be something worth taking. But otherwise, beyond that, most of the equipment you're going to find in, you know, your pediatric airway uh, compartment, as well as um, your inter-hospital transfer pack. So having a think about before the job, what equipment you want to take, I think is really important. And just remember that you may need to get some of this gear or get, for example, some medications in greater quantity before you take off because a lot of the facilities you may go to may not be able to part with the extra gear that you may think you might need. I wanted to talk briefly about obstetric medications and I wanted to talk about the ones that you guys have in your IHT pack. The reason I think we should talk about it briefly is they're not always medications you use very commonly. And I think it's important, again, in the pre-planning of these jobs or just getting some familiarity with what would be a pretty uncommon job is just having a think about the drugs you carry and how you might use them. And it really just goes back to what would you actually do. So we're going to talk about some of them that you have and just what their uses are and how you might give them. Okay, so we're going to talk about salbutamol first. I'm sure the majority of people, their only involvement with obstetric salbutamol has been to sign the drug checklist, and that, for the most part, is mine as well. But look, I guess what you want to take out of this, and it is a very small quantity, is take, you know, 250 micrograms, dilute that further so that you have 25 micrograms per mil, 
And then if you're going to provide tocolysis for a patient, then you're just going to give 2 mils or 50 micrograms um, up to 2 to 5 times. But usually doing this twice or 100 mics works adequately for tocolysis. The role of tocolysis is, you know, pretty accepted in preterm labor transfer, but really I'd, I'd see no disadvantage to tocolizing a term labor patient either, whether that be for reduction of fetal distress or just reducing your risk of a birth in transit. Clearly that's going to be so infrequent that there's going to be no quality studies powered adequately to prove it works. But I can tell you having been there, I'll tocolize all women from now until the end of my career. The next one's magnesium sulfate, and I guess everyone's reasonably familiar with this in the setting of arrhythmia management, um, asthma management, and I guess an ever-increasing array of indications in the at least the emergency department. But in preeclampsia, we use this uh, not uncommonly for seizure prevention. Now, it's important you have some idea how it's given. You In your in IHT pack, there's two... 10 mil or a total of 20 millimoles of magsulf, which works out close to 5 grams, just a, a tiny bit under, in 20 mils. And for preeclampsia, the dose is typically 4 grams over half an hour, followed by 1 gram per hour. Now, there's actually some international variation here. So, you know, if you give a bit more than that over the first 30 minutes, it's not a big deal. In the States, they use 6 grams. But look, I guess you want a bit of a rule of thumb about how that's utilized. Um, this is a medication you may want to get an extra vial or two from, from the base, just because you can probably see, despite transport times being short, there's a, an opportunity there to run out of medication. Hydralazine is another medication not commonly used by most retrievalists. It is used in some hospital departments for blood pressure control and it is carried for this uh, indication in most services but again it's not commonly used so when you const reconstitute this vial then really you need to think about how you might utilize it and if you guys carry 20 milligrams of hydralazine you know really you're going to be using five milligrams at a time every five to ten minutes to try and achieve some blood pressure control now it's important to understand when you might use it so typically, blood pressure lowering is done in pregnancy when it's more than 160 on 110. And just targeting the definition of high blood pressure in pregnancy being 140 on 90. So there doesn't need to be drastic lowering of blood pressure in most cases. And I guess we're pretty comfortable with that concept with a lot of our hypertensive emergency management. But again, just have a think about how you're going to use these drugs, what you're actually going to do and how you're going to draw it up and deliver it if the need ever arises. Now, there's two more medications we'll talk about. Oxytocin is a pretty common one utilized in the treatment and prevention of postpartum hemorrhage, and it's going to be possibly one of the more common drugs you might use on obstetric jobs if there has been a baby delivered. Um, there's some, in terms of preventing postpartum hemorrhage, there's a couple of schools of thought. I'm, I'm not going to sit and argue with some of the, you know, literature around, you know, the effective concentration or effective dose of oxytocin being, you know, two to three units um, for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. But there's been, you know, some recent 2019 uh, RCT data suggesting 10 units intravenously is both safe and efficacious. And I think the idea of titrating this medication to effect, which may be the background of anyone who's done some uh, anaesthetic time, is probably not com super relevant in a moving rotary wing aircraft. Just because it's a challenging environment and unlike in the operating theatre, you're going to get less opportunity for feedback on uterine turn. So I think we can be a bit less physicianly when you know our backs are against the wall. In terms of further management of postpartum hemorrhage, we can just give five unit IV boluses. You know, that's commonly followed by an infusion of 40 units over four hours, but you're probably going to be landed by this point. So just some intermittent bolusing is going to be completely reasonable. Now, we're pretty comfortable with tranexamic acid as a medication that we use in the setting of trauma it's again like magnesium its indication spectrum is just getting broader by the month um, 
there's some controversy, I think, as its role in postpartum hemorrhage. I wasn't necessarily super impressed with the results of the woman trial, but I think we're in a somewhat austere environment in retrieval medicine, and so giving a gram of TXA is probably completely reasonable in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage. So I guess I hope that just having a few things that you might be able to draw upon in these uncommon obstetric jobs I hope the discussion of what you carry in your inter-hospital transfer pack is going to be helpful because as I said again, and we're going to go over this again, I really want you to know what are you actually going to do on these jobs. Now, while we have the opportunity, I thought we'd talk about a brief case. This is a completely fictional case, but I hope that it may help you guys think about how you're going to manage some of the different aspects of these jobs or at least give everyone the opportunity to sit down and mentally plan out how they might deal with these things when they get a call and essentially having to leave in 5, 10, 15 minutes. So let's say we've got a 19-year-old woman. It's her first pregnancy and she's at term. So she's 39 weeks. Her pregnancy's been uncomplicated and she's got no significant medical or obstetric problems. And she's been in labor for a couple of hours and is around five centimeters dilated. Now she's here, she's in Oberon. And if you look at the map down the bottom, that's a, uh, a small town, you know, over 100 kilometers west of Penrith. And having not flown this track, I'll, but I would say this is probably somewhere around a 23 to 26 minute flight on a 139 in the air, not including loading, not including two-minute shutdown and obviously transferring the patient off the aircraft into the hospital, but probably, you know, 20, 25 or so minutes flight time. Her membranes are intact and her vital signs show she's a bit hypertensive, as we discussed. Um, her fetal heart rate or the baby's heart rate uh, more specifically is elevated, so normal is 110 to 160. And she's got some protein in her urine. So essentially, we've got a a lady in active labor in a facility that can't deliver the baby with some evidence of preeclampsia and fetal distress. Now, there's often so many solutions here. There's road transfer capability. Further away, there's fixed wing. But just for argument's sake, let's discuss the case as if a rotary wing transfer is the only option for us. So you're going to take this lady to Nepean, where she's been uh, accepted. That is part of the perinatal network for Oberon. And I guess now, what are you going to do? The first question I thought I'd ask is, what are you worried about? I mean, it would be completely normal if the answer to that is everything. But, you know, you've got a few things to worry about. You've got the fact that the lady's in labor. You might be worried about being present when the baby is born. You might be worried about worsening preeclampsia or eclampsia. You might be worried about the fetal distress and the need for neonatal resuscitation. You know, you might be worried about the aircraft. You might be worried about the the gear that you, you, you have or don't have. And you might be worried about the fact that you don't have much obstetric experience. This is a really challenging job, one that, you know, I've performed a lot in an interstate service and, you know, you may get exposed to if you work interstate or occasionally within New South Wales. The next question is, are you going to transport? Now, this is a question you need to ask yourself in isolation when you're on the job. You can talk to the state retrieval consultant or the duty retrieval consultant. There's even a, a pathway within the perinatal networks where there's a obstetrician on call for, for discussion about these things. But... I guess all I would say is they are complicated decisions and there's many factors that, you know, often come into play. And so just, I mean, I would share the decision around, um, but it's going to be a difficult uh, decision and you can't really have, um, you know, black and white cutoffs or or rationale for these things. It's a really tricky and murky area. So if you're not going to transport, the next question is, how long are you going to sit there before you reevaluate that decision? Clearly, you're going to be providing clinical care and ongoing evaluation of the woman, but how long before you decide, geez, maybe we should get going? If you do decide to transport the woman, how are you going to make that safer? You know, we talked about the use of tocolysis. We've also talked about 
um, the aircraft and the medications and the equipment and at least your mental rehearsal with your flight paramedic and air crew about what some of the issues might be and how you might deal with them. We're all pretty comfortable with the idea of the S's, considering our staff, our space, our stuff. You know, I've talked about staff and largely that's going to be, you know, working with the crew so they have an understanding of what our priorities are. You know, working closely with your flight paramedics during your downtime on, on base and just working out how you might approach these obstetric jobs. We've talked about the space, how to configure the back of the 139, perhaps leave the bridge at home, Zoll in the, in the back behind the nets, dock and power on wander straps, dock sitting on the rear port side forward facing chair. Now in terms of equipment and drugs, you know, we've talked about perhaps grabbing the delivery pack from a road ambulance. You know, we've talked about the obstetric drugs, drugs that we might use and maybe you need to grab an extra vial or two of those. The last S that I like to think about all the time, whenever we prepare for any problem, whether that be, you know, an incoming resuscitation in the hospital or a job coming through um, on a retrieval shift, and that is strategy. So I think it really needs to be staff, space, stuff, and strategy. And what I mean by that, again, is what will you actually do? If the blood pressure continues to get higher and higher, we've talked about using a cutoff of around 160 on 110 as an indication to lower the blood pressure, in your case with some small boluses of hydralazine, to a target blood pressure of 140 on 90. You know, this might be also a time to institute um, some magnesium sulfate prophylaxis for preeclampsia, which would be common in a woman with high blood pressure like this. What are you actually going to do if the patient has a seizure in the cabin en route? I'm not sure if anyone's had this clinical scenario outside of obstetrics, but it is again quite challenging. I mean, largely, the important things are going to be mostly first aid with suction, positioning, oxygen. But then, as you may need to escalate your therapy... My mental model for seizure in pregnancy is really to provide some magnesium sulfate at the doses we discussed, and then if ongoing seizure activity, to essentially revert back to a status uh, epilepticus algorithm. In terms of, you know, eclamptic seizure, it's important to remember they're typically short, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, where they terminate fairly quickly and leave the woman postictal. So it's not common in eclampsia to get status, but just have a think about these things and think about what you would actually do. Now, birth in transit is probably everyone's fear here, and that's completely reasonable. But have a think about what you're going to do if this seems like it's imminent. Or what are you going to do if this actually happens? Now that might include understanding how to support and deliver the baby after it's crowned. You know, you're not going to be able to coach the woman and reduce her pushing through crowning. The, the background noise in a 139 is going to sort of inhibit any clear communication as I'm sure you're all aware of. But just having an understanding that just gent gentle downward traction, um, you know, towards the, the woman's bottom is going to be helpful in delivering the anterior shoulder. And then typically, again, just lifting then upwards or anteriorly is, you know, sufficient to deliver the rest of the baby. After that, you're going to need to think about where you might assess this baby and how you might assess it. And that, again, this is going to be all more challenging en route in the back of a 139. There's not a lot of room there, but you, I, my suggestion would be that you'd you, bend up the woman's knees and that buys you 60 to 70 centimeters of stretcher beneath her feet where you might be able to lay the baby down from that seat you're sitting in, dry and stimulate and then provide some early room air resuscitation um, with positive pressure ventilation if required. Let's say the birth doesn't go smoothly and you think the woman has shoulder dystocia and that's really just evidenced by the head being delivered and the body not following with just simple maneuvers that we've discussed. This would clearly be an absolute nightmare if all the other stuff wasn't already a nightmare 
but have a think about what you're actually going to do and how you're going to adapt that to this new or this uncommon environment for obstetric jobs. You know, if we review briefly what shoulder dystocia is, you can see on the left here that it's the anterior or uppermost shoulder being impacted behind the pubic symphysis. And the right-hand picture just really shows you some of the interventions that might be helpful. So flexing the, the, the woman's knees up, sort of knees to nipples, and then using some suprapubic pressure. You know, there are more complicated obstetric algorithms for this condition and, and many conditions, but I want you to have a real think about how you're actually going to deal with these things en route, maybe in a dimly lit, noisy cabin, because I guess this is the reason you're all on these jobs, to deal with these things if they come up. What are you going to do if the baby isn't breathing? Now, some people will have done some neonatal resuscitation or uh, neonatal intensive care terms or pediatric terms. I guess what you take away from that is that the basics done really well in newborn babies typically are all that it's required. But again, you're going to need to, to mentally simulate or, and or you know, physically simulate these problems so that you can deal with them more effectively. In terms of neonatal resuscitation, largely most of the benefit, particularly at term, is going to be around establishing effective positive pressure ventilation. Now, in terms of what equipment you use, I've worked on a service that carry the, the, the T-piece Neopuff, which is a fantastic piece of equipment for neonatal resuscitation. But realistically, it's quite limited in its utility for an unexpected delivery. And that, the reason for that is you've got to set it up, do some checks, and it's all very much flow-driven. I think your best bet is to really get just some towels to dry and stimulate the baby and then simply use a neonatal BVM or a, a collapsed down pediatric BVM, ideally with a PEEP valve. And that can provide some effective room air resuscitation, even if it isn't connected to oxygen, which is another, I guess, fairly straightforward step. So have a think about that. And remember when you're actually going to do this. So if the baby's you know, limp or has poor respiratory effort or a heart rate under 100, these are going to be the times when you're going to start instituting positive pressure ventilation with room air and PEEP. Now, there's clearly more to the management of all these problems and there's algorithms and guidelines to help you learn more and I absolutely suggest you read them but I really want everyone to feel a bit empowered to deal with the initial moments of these difficult crises in the back of the aircraft. The last one is postpartum hemorrhage. Now, I think more commonly you might get this as a um, inter-facility transfer where a PPH has been established and some treatment has been instituted. But I want you to think about what you would do if a baby is born, the baby is or isn't okay, but it's dealt with, and then the woman has some third stage bleeding that's quite heavy. You know, we talked about 800 mils per minute of bleeding in third um, in third stage or because of the placental blood flow and that can be life-threatening and I think the things to take home from in the rotary wing aircraft is give oxytocin early we've talked about how it can be given and give and 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 then I would suggest early bimanual compression you know the idea of putting a battery balloon in this platform is just I think you know I, I don't think that's going to be done properly um, the people talk about sort of manual compression of the aorta with a fist Again, I worry about the utility or effectiveness of that and I really think that simple biomanual compression, although clearly invasive and it, I can tell you it's very uncomfortable for women, is going to be your ideal form of hemorrhage control. So have a practice on this with your obstetric trainers and your flight nurses and have a think about how you would actually do this. How I was taught was imagine that you're putting your hand into a Pringles jar and you can imagine how you need to bring your fingers together and point your hand to get down to those Pringles. Use that to go into the anterior fornix of the vagina before you make a fist so that it's far e more easily tolerable for the woman. And then use your other hand, which is typically a non-dominant hand, to bring the uterus down on top of the fist as seen in this picture. But have a think about what you're actually going to do and how you're exactly going to do it in this setting. And, of course, we mentioned uh, tranexamic acid. So, 
if it hasn't been made clear already, I guess my biggest message and my biggest question, whether this be obstetrics or trauma or some other critical illness, you know, you have a lot of time in this job on base where you are drinking coffee, doing checks, doing sims, maybe doing other stuff. Use this time to really think about what are you actually going to do and really nail down on the specifics because it'll make your job easier when these uncommon things arise. If you want some more info on some of these topics, I have a foam website, obcast.net. It just goes into a lot more detail around lots of common obstetric problems aimed at people who don't look after pregnant women commonly. So if that's helpful for you, great. Um, I just thought I'd mention that it's there because clearly this talk's been very brief in terms of dealing with obstetric emergencies. So that's really all I had to say. I know that um, obstetric jobs on a rotary wing platform are uncommon, um, but I can tell you from my own experience they can also be challenging. So I hope uh, this talk's added some value. I hope you can all think about you know, exactly how you're going to approach these jobs in terms of the, the aircraft, the equipment you take, in terms of the strategy of how to deal with some of these different problems. And I uh, hope that the whole Obstetric edu Education Day has been, uh, has been good for you guys. All the best. <laughs>